Hi, this is Dominic Keating. I played Lieutenant Malcolm Reed on Enterprise, as you probably know, and you are listening to the NX7062 podcast. Enjoy. Yes, you are listening to the NX7062 podcast here in the summer of New Jersey. It was 70 today. I, I honestly don't get that, but uh, here we are. It is Monday night. It is 10 p.m. here on the East Coast. It's dinner time out on the West Coast. But even so, I still can get people from the West Coast to agree to do my podcast because they're just so awesome and they want to come and and talk to y'all. And, you know, I was sitting here trying to decide what shirt I was going to wear tonight. And then I decided to go out to my mailbox, broke a nail in the process, but I found a red shirt, the shirt that I ordered last week, thanks to work, thanks to war dog that Kalel right now is blocking y'all from seeing maybe he's a little jealous but it does say single taken and then checked off it says mentally dating malcolm reed and i thought how fun is this i should own it balance out the fact that i have a, a trip only shirt now i have a malcolm only shirt so you know the scales are all balanced speaking of which i actually finally became a patron of the shuttle pod show took me long enough, I know, to get there, but I did become a patron of the Shuttle Pod show, all because I absolutely 100% could not wait until tomorrow for their special guest announcement for their new season, which, if I am not mistaken, they said is dropping on November 27th. So I'm not I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but I know who it is, and you guys are all going to love it when they announce it tomorrow if you're not a patron of the Shuttle Pod show and you have to wait. Um, for the big announcement, but I am so excited for the Shuttle Pod Show's return and for the very, very, very special guest that they got, uh, that Mark was dropping hints, something about, you know, all six original movies and all that fun stuff. So you guys are going to be really stoked when you find out who that, who that is. Um, and just because you missed, you know, just because you might've missed the chance to get the sneak peek at this announcement does not mean you should not go support the shuttle pod show and me we're all on patreon um and we all can't do this without your support it really does help uh, i think connor and dominic said in one of the things that helps keeps the lights on it really does um we all love coming to you i love coming to you especially when i have amazing guests like the one that's coming up in a minute um and every little bit helps and i know muhammad is a proud patron of uh of this podcast. Um, another podcast that you guys really need to look into, obviously, is The Seventh Rule. They had some amazing announcements come through uh, late last week. So uh, go check out what's going on with The Seventh Rule because we are Chat Pack 2.0, but we got to give props to the original Chat Pack and The Seventh Rule and Sirach and Ryan. So with all of that being said, with all that out of the way, with me modeling my brand new t-shirt, I'm about to introduce to you a man whose name you have probably seen if you are watching anything new that relates to Star Trek. That means Prodigy, Lower Decks, Discovery, uh, Missing One, and Strange New Worlds. And without further ado, here he is, the one and only, Rod Roddenberry. Hey, Rod. Hey, how you doing? Thank I'm you doing so much good. for having me. Well, thank you so much for, like I said, for cutting into your dinner time and joining us. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. See, I've, I've got my old man soup right here so I can eat and talk, but not on camera. And you promise not to slurp. And I promise not to slurp. Well, so. <laughs> I was crossing my fingers, though. I'm just oh. <laughs> Well, just remember, this is going to be out there for all posterity. So at some point, if you start slurping soup. Oh, no, don't worry. I, I look forward to, to all that uh, <laughs> Internet stuff about the old man sipping soup. There you go. You're not even that old. You're younger than I am. So don't start calling yourself an old man quite yet. Yeah. Um, but let me, I want to get this out of the way first because one of my regulars, um, Robert, couldn't be here. He I was actually at Rhode Island Comic Con this past weekend and he is driving home tonight. So he couldn't be here. But when he heard you were going to be here, he had a very specific question for you. Yeah, shoot. The 25th anniversary 
convention in LA? 1991. Did you go? I, I think that's the 1991. Uh, I Don't make do me do math. math. I Don't know. Make me do I, math. I, I'm, 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 so if it was the one at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, I was there. And there was Actually, footage. Six, yeah, you know what? I did that. 66 plus 25. Yeah, you're right. It was 91. God, okay. Uh, lucky guess on my part. Um, yes. So I was there. I was, oh, don't make me do the math on my, on how old I, well, I was right around 16, 17. Um, that was the year that my father passed away and uh, I was there and I don't, I mean, if, if he was there, then he was, then he, okay. Then he would have seen, and, and, and assuming he was in the auditorium, he saw my father wheeled out on stage. I, I wheeled my father out on stage with long black hair as a teenager. Oh my gosh. And, uh, yeah. And then, um, and then stood by him as he spoke. Okay. So there is a very specific question. There was a card presented to your dad that had been signed by all the attendees of the convention. Okay. And Robert was in the group that presented him the card. So there were pictures taken, but I guess the presenters weren't allowed to take pictures at the time. Only, I guess, the official convention people were taking the pictures. And right. Robert was in that picture. And he, the question, the very specific question was, do you, did you take, do you have any pictures from that? Uh, we have video footage, but not from what he's talking about. Um, okay. Uh, there, I mean, there's a small chance. I, I have gone through a ton of our photos. And, I mean, I've definitely gone through all of them at least once. There right. are a number of photos that I look at and I go, what the heck's this? You know, where'd this come from? Who, who's this about? So there is a small chance I have it. Uh, very small. Um, but there's no way I could tell you right now without... Spending a week of, of, <laughs> of going through photos. So are you kind of like the official archivist at this point? Well, I'm the official archivist of everything Roddenberry because uh, aside from uh, uh, my son, uh, I, I am the only male heir to Roddenberry. So I'm, I'm yes, I am the official Roddenberry archivist. Oh, there you, uh, go. you, you can call it that. Um, there although, you I mean, I have a lot of people helping me. Let's put it that way. Right. Well, um, Richard Arnold, I think, also was a, was helping with that, if I'm not mistaken. He was. I mean, everyone in their own way who's loved Star Trek has preserved Star Trek in their own way and probably has tons of documents and files and stuff like that. And, right. and I'm trying to scan them and get them all into one database. Oh, that would so be amazing. If, if anyone has anything that they want to share, and they don't have to give up the original. I, I, I don't care about, I don't want to say I don't care about originals, but I'm not asking for originals. Um, I'm just asking for scans. So if anyone out there has scripts with notes on it or call sheets or, or, or internal memos or anything that's unique to Star Trek and, and is part of a Star Trek internal history, uh, I would love digital copies of that because we are really putting together an archive of everything and we're cataloging it. And um, I'm happy to share some uh, links on, the, on how we're doing that. We're working with a company called Otoy and uh, we're preserving everything digitally not just so you can look at documents, but they are scanning props, they're, they're scanning ships, they're recreating ships. We're getting to the point where you'll be able to put on some sort of VR gear, walk aboard any enterprise or any ship of your choosing, and then access the computers and go through either documents that are relevant to the TV show or documents that are relevant to the creation of Star Trek. So, oh, that's amazing. Um, and this isn't something that's uh, 20 years off. This is something that's uh, five to 10 years off. Well, that, that, oh my God, that, that would be such an incredible gift to every, yeah. every fan of Star Trek. That's amazing. We're going to owe you a huge of debt course, of gratitude. You don't have to go onto the ship to do this. We'll have them accessible <laughs> in other areas, but it'll be cool to walk onto a one to one, uh, life size, <laughs> realistic, photorealistic version of the ship right. and walk around it. Like the NX-01, my ship. Yeah, well, this is yeah. the ISS, but NX-01. I just have to give a shout out. Lasso just said red shirt, which is a Star Trek fan. We all know, ha ha. He's not even a Star Trek fan. He's just a really good friend of mine that is incredibly supportive. Um, and I love the fact that we have, he's been learning and now he knows red shirt because this whole, nice. my whole podcast has been a big learning experience for him. So, so shout out to Lasso. He's obviously in case you can't tell a huge wonder Woman. <laughs> Hey Lasso, how you doing buddy? <laughs> and, and yes, red, red shirts rock. They do. All the time. They do. They do. They do. Which leads to, I mean, if you were a red shirt on TOS, that was a bad thing, but there were a lot of red uniforms on TNG. So I want to get right into um, 
the cocktail party that we attended, John Billing to help announce Trek Talks Two and support Trek's talk, support Trek Talks Two. Um, we were chatting, and actually, the first thing that I heard you say was this really great story about kind of like the behind the scenes part of TNG um, that yeah. we were talking about you sharing. So I give the floor to you. I well, want to hear all about this. No, no. I mean, I'll, I'll gladly share it. Uh, um, when I was, I keep wanting to say 13, 14, something around that age. I mean, whatever 1986 was, um, I was just out of sixth grade. It was summer. And my father, um, like, like some fathers do, they want to teach their kids what it's like to, to have a job and, and, and I guess earn a living to a degree. You know, I was a very privileged kid. So he forced me that summer to work at uh, Paramount. Forced? To work on the new show. Forced. <laughs> because as a kid, I, I wanted to go play. I wanted to go to camp. I wanted to go I'm play sure. with my friends. Um, so so uh, he, he forced me. I mean, he did. Uh, not not that I was kicking and screaming, but, you know, I, I wanted to go play. Anyhow, uh, it was pre-production for uh, 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 the original, uh, sorry, The Next Generation, uh, season one. And I had a bike and would run around the lot. I remember the production offices were still in a little uh, trailer. They didn't have actual offices or anything like that. My father had his own office, but it was just because of his deal with Paramount. Um, the production office for the show was in a trailer. It was in a couple trailers. And I remember taking these giant bikes around with baskets and delivering scripts and, and, and uh, one-inch tapes and, I mean, all sorts of things to different departments. And it, it, was, a, it was a ton of fun. I, being a kid, I would jump those things off. I remember I, I broke the, uh, the forks on two of them. Um, I crashed into everything. And it was back before, back before security was such – Back before 9-11, so, you know, when I used the word, I would terrorize security on a lot. It was just me riding around like a maniac. Uh, I would probably not <laughs> use that terminology today because it could be uh, misconstrued. Um, but, uh, you know, it, there were, I don't want to say no rules. There are certainly rules, but I was just the young punk riding around. And so it was, it was a ton of fun. Um, I can't say I, I learned a lot because I wasn't looking at the job in that way. Um, but uh, I, I did learn a lot by visiting departments and seeing the kind of people and seeing the love that people had for working on this show. Uh, it didn't ever seem like they were doing it just for the money. It seemed like they were there because they wanted to be a part of the next Star Trek. And that's, and that this was, was what I took away the most. And that was before, that was before it even premiered. So this was, was all before it even premiered. Yeah. This is everyone's anticipation of being part of Star Trek, the next generation. What is this next Star Trek? You know, so everyone's just super excited and proud to be part of it. Now, we, we chatted a little bit before you came on. Um, I was I always like to check up, you know, obviously on my on my uh, guests. And so I checked out your Wikipedia page. And knowing that story and hearing you have said that, you know, you were 13 or so when you were writing out of the lot. And the Wikipedia entry said that it wasn't really until after your father passed away that you kind of got into Star Trek or really started to, I guess, investigate you know, what it was yeah. that he had created. So even, so you felt the love when you were 13, but you really didn't really start so, to. Yeah, I, I guess I really haven't looked at my uh, Wikipedia page in I think many, many, many years. So I don't know what it says. Um, but I think the part that, that may be a little bit off, which makes sense. Um, I did work on the show as a PA, a production assistant, delivering coffee and scripts and these sorts of things. But as I mentioned, I didn't, I don't want to say I didn't care, but I mean, I didn't care. I didn't take it seriously. I didn't have that same feeling like, oh, what's the next Star Trek? Because I wasn't a Star Trek fan at that point. I hadn't really watched all the original series episodes. I went to conventions and it was just fun to watch people in costume. But I didn't know what Star Trek meant. I didn't know its impact. You know, I was into Star Wars at that time. I was into <laughs> the Knight Rider at that time. No, I Love really was. I was a late groomer. Yeah, but those were more one-dimensional shows. And, and by no means am I saying anything negative. I mean, those are great shows. Uh, but I didn't get Star Trek. So it wasn't until my father passed away, because I was just a rebellious teenager from the age 13 to 17. Uh, he passed away when I was 17. I was rebellious. I was into heavy metal and driving cars and, 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 
and checking out girls and, you know, whatever a young little punk might be into. And um, it was when he passed away that, that, you know, obviously experience of losing someone is traumatic and, and can affect your life. And that was sort of my smack in the face, you know, my, my, my dose of reality to go like, hold on, you know, what, what is all of this around me? What does it mean? Why are there all these people coming to my father's memorial service? I don't get it. You know, what, what is this? I know people like him, but it's just a TV show. So that's, those are the kinds of things that kind of wake you up and you start, you start noticing things here and there. And, and then it starts right. to sink in over the next few years, really. You know, it's interesting because a lot of times when you, when you watch, you know, actors or whatever, you know, interviewed on the shows and they have kids and, you know, oh, did you ever, you know, push your kid towards acting or whatever. So I guess what you're saying is that, you know, Majel Barrett and Gene Ronberry were your parents and they never really sat, said, you need to watch this. It was so important to so many people. They just let you kind of come into it organically. They did. They did. That, that's one thing that I, I really love about them. Uh, they did that in many ways. You know, religion was never a thing. They wanted me to explore and sort of find my own, uh, my own way, which was good and bad because <laughs> I went through a number <laughs> of things and made a lot of mistakes and continue to make a lot of mistakes. The, the trick is to hopefully learn from those mistakes. Um, yeah. So, so they, they let me figure it out sort of on my own and didn't force me to do that. They did want me they did encourage me to maybe get into the industry. There's, there's five or six commercials I did as a young, young kid. I don't know, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, Kingsford Charcoal, Granola Clusters, Crystal Foods, Max Steel's Robot Force, One to Grow On. And I can't remember if there's another one. So there are these, these hidden gems out there. And when I say gems, they are very much in the rough of me. <laughs> trying to act and from that point I decided I would never act again because I'm terrible you're just you're happier behind the scenes yeah <laughs> happier out of the limelight there you go well I will tell you you know it's funny because um you said Knight Rider and Knight Rider actually does have a Star Trek connection because Robert O'Reilly uh Gowron from mm -hmm. TNG and Deep Space Nine was actually in a couple episodes of Knight Rider it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I don't know which one he was, but it uh, makes perfect sense. Yeah, he actually said um, he didn't quite get the whole concept of the talking car, which was really funny. <laughs> he's, he's told some really funny stories about, about because when you're doing the scene, obviously you're not talking to the car. There's somebody off camera reading you lines, and he's like, <laughs> what is that? And they're like, no, you're talking to the car. Yep. I, yeah. I, 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 as a kid, I, you know, I never really... A talking car seemed amazing back then, and now we've got cars yeah. that can can do almost more. They're, yeah. they're just as fast. They just can't turbo boost. Oh, yeah. turbo boosting. Not yet. Uh, Elon Musk, that he's, he's nutty enough to make something like that happen, I'm sure. Oh, I am sure. But that's the show that made, I felt. That was the first. I loved Mustangs, but when Night Rider came on, Black Trans Ams. But they were always so disappointing. Whenever I saw one in the real world, because they didn't have the little center thing that was red, they just had the regular headlights, and that was always so disappointing to me that there wasn't anything in the middle. You, you know, a quick quick story that I, I don't think I've really ever told before. I might have told this before, but um, my uh, I used to love before that. I used to love Smokey and the Bandit. Oh sure. And he he had the Firebird, the the Trans Am, but it was a Pontiac or Firebird, I believe, and it was black. Yeah, with the, with the Firebird on the hood. Yep. 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 And so I loved that car so much that when my father, he was in between cars, he went out and leased a white Trans Am because I loved it so much. So he kind of did that for me for, I can't wow. remember, if it was a year or a couple or two years or something like that. Um, I remember being a little disappointed because it was <laughs> white and it looked nothing like the actual Firebird. But still, I appreciated the... The gesture, yeah, absolutely. That that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, that is really cool. Um, so we were talking also before camera. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was your mom because yes. she, she and your dad have both been there since literally the beginning. Yes. And um, you called her an unsung hero, and I think that that's very true. Um, you know, besides besides Christine Chapel. Um, I think sometimes people forget that she was a female first officer. Had the cage been the one that NBC greenlit, mm -hmm. she would have been, you know, a female first officer, which would have been an amazing accomplishment. But they thought that was crazy back then. 
<laughs> a woman second in command. How how crazy is that? How dare they? Yes, I think I think she probably should have been first in command, and I think we should all we should have started with women in command back then because it would be a lot better off today as a society. That's very true. I mean, I mean, obviously having Nichelle Nichols on the bridge as Lieutenant Uhura was just as groundbreaking. But yeah, but yeah. um, yeah, I, well, she, I mean. She, Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, she really is an unsung hero. She, she, you know, not only did she portray all those different characters, the voice of the computer, the Loxana, um, uh, and of course, Chapel. Um, she, she, you know, we talked about this a little bit, dealing with a man like my father. And listen, women have to deal with a lot of things. Men have to deal with things too. Sure, sure, sure. But it, just specifically talking about my mother in that era, um, Dealing with a man like my father was uh, no no party. Um, right. Sure, there there were plenty of good times, but there were also plenty of bad times. Whether my father was down on his luck and 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 being told, you know, he, he can't be a part of the next Star Trek, which did happen, or he was off with uh, other women, or you know, there's many things. He was not a perfect man. Um, I, I talk about it in, uh, in my documentary, Trek Nation. And uh, the, the idea is not to dig up dirt on him and, and show him as a bad human, but to show him that we're all fallible. We're, we all make mistakes. We all have, uh, dark is too strong of a word, but for the sake of this conversation, darker sides to us. But you can still be an incredible human being. You can still be a visionary you can still look at a better future you can still believe in humanity working together um that's that's the kind of image of my father that i want but my mother was really pivotal to making that happen without her i don't know if he would have had the success he had because he always had her to fall back on do you think being that you know everybody's flawed everybody has these darker sides you know, and like you said, your father, you know, went through a lot. Do you think that that somehow influenced his vision of the future that he brought forth in Star Trek? That, you know, if he wants to see something brighter and better? Here, I, I don't, so, so just so everyone knows where I'm coming from on this, you know, obviously I'm not trying to speak for my father because I'm not him. Sure. And... And no, no, and I just want to say it out loud so anyone listening knows that I know <laughs> that I am not Gene Roddenberry, um, nor do do I want to be or try to be. Um, but but we never sat down and talked about why he did things. Again, I was seventeen when he passed away. I was rebellious, right. so there's a lot of things that I wish you know I, I had been more mature and done differently, um, or would like to do today if I had the opportunity. But um, he. He had an incredible life. He, he started, I mean, as a bomber pilot in World War II and did something like 80 missions in the South Pacific. He, he saw, you know, he saw people get killed. He, he was part of defending his, his American troops. And, you know, whether he directly did it or dropped a bomb and did it, he killed people too. He saw the worst of humanity. But I think he also saw the best of humanity. I mean, I think when you see something so atrocious as war, and I have not fought, so I cannot speak for anyone who has, right. uh, but I would assume when you see something so horrific that I imagine it changes you and gives you some sort of unique perspective, and that could either be one of, of, of disgust and, and, I guess, not having belief in humanity or understanding that we need to do the opposite of this if we're going to succeed. We need to not not just have wars, but we need to embrace our uniqueness. That's the whole fundamental idea behind the Idic philosophy. Um, right. It's, it's the differences that, that make us great. It's the differences that we grow and evolve from. Uh, if, we, if we fear those differences and, and want to fight over them, we're not going to evolve and we're not going to grow. Um, and I think, honestly, I think that was summed up so well in one of my favorite original episodes, um, Let This Be Our Last Battlefield. Mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you know you got mm -hmm. so yeah you got the, the the i don't remember the name of the alien race um but they got so know. wrapped up in, in their hatred of each other for something that had nothing to do with anything except the colors the literal flip of the colors of their skin um yeah. 
and they ended up and they ended up destroying themselves. And it was repeated in an episode of Enterprise, um, which is basically the same thing with these two warring factions over, you know, were were was something created in seven days or ten days. Um, oh wow! You know, I haven't seen that episode yeah. yet. Oh my god! Don't ask me for the title because I suck at titles. Uh, no, it was, okay. I know it was. It was the third season. It was the third season Zindi arc episode, um, but it was the same. And, and especially because that season was so influenced by nine eleven. Um, yeah. You know, but it was literally it was it was two it was one culture warring over a slight difference in ideologies, and the and the one faction. Uh, took over the Enterprise, and they were going to use the Enterprise because it was a superior ship, and they were going to go back to their planet, and they were going to, you know, win this war once and for all, and win for their side, and there was nothing left to go back to because they'd been gone for you so know, long. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, both of those episodes are incredibly relevant then and now. I mean, e even now, and 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 taking race out of it because there's still obviously plenty of relevance to. Uh, uh, race and social injustice, but I mean, the the idea that um, there there's what's going on with us being so split in terms of uh, Republicans and Democrats, and and having you know we're at a place where we're not even willing to listen to each other. And listen, right. I'm not criticizing everyone. I'll point at myself and say I have thoughts and feelings because I have my ideas. And when I hear someone say something that I think is ridiculous. I just immediately say, that's stupid, that's ridiculous, as opposed to, and every now and then I check myself and, and take this tact, but I don't want to sound too, uh, too, too uh, I don't know, um, overly mentally liberated in this sense. But every now and then I say, wait a second, you should take a moment and actually try to understand what they're saying. Right. Um, but we, we just get so, I guess, worked up and emotional about our points of view that we can't, it's hard to hear the other person. Right, and then... And right, and both of those episodes of those epi took it to the extreme, which mm -hmm. sometimes I think is the best way to get a message across. Sometimes subtly just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. all right. So Faith says you're a cool guest, and she's sorry Hi. she's late. <laughs> Hi, Faith. Welcome. Welcome. No, welcome. no worries on being late. We are. We're just really glad that you're here. We know this. I know the seventh rule is wrapping up. I'm sure Linda popped over from from the. I I run. I start my show a little bit before the seventh rule podcast ends theirs. So sometimes people actually double watch, which I love, but um, speaking of listening and, and appreciating other people, Hey, Tony Fett um, is that there are so many podcasts out there, but Star Trek is, you could talk, you can have a thousand podcasts covering Star Trek and still none of them will be talking about the same thing. Yep. So, I've got nothing but love for other Star Trek podcasts. I support other Star Trek podcasts, especially the ones with the people that I know, like Ciroc and Ryan over at The Seventh Rule or The Shuttle Pod Show with Connor Trenier and Dominic Keating, um, hence my mentally dating Malcolm Reed shirt. Um, but uh, no, I think it's great. I, I have friends that are podcasters. I think, I think podcasting is wonderful. I think it's a great way to, you know, gather the chat pack, as we call it, and bring everybody in and and have these amazing discussions. Um, my very favorite episode of TOS, which is not politically motivated, but it's so, it's culture, but it, it speaks about, you know, embracing cultures and understanding other people. Um, it was a muck time. And I mean, your mom got soup thrown at her. I thought, I loved her in that episode. I thought she was very sweet. Um, and the whole crush on Mr. Spock thing kind of came to a head in that episode. Yep, yep. Uh, um, but um, I just, I love that episode. I love seeing that other side of Mr. Spock, you know, and I think, again, it talks about it, it, you know, maybe a little more subtly, but it just talks about differences. And you think, you know, Vulcans, well, guess what? Look what happens every seven years. <laughs> yes, that and, was a great one. Although, uh, talk about, I, I love Star Trek because it's believable. Uh, I, I don't know if I believe any creature could go seven years without mating. I, I don't well, know. there's, there's, and see, and I thought that too, but there's a lot of talk now, especially with Strange New Worlds, that they don't, that, that it's an imperative every seven years and taking yeah. a mate every seven years, but that does not preclude them from having those sorts of interactions between those seven years. Yeah, no, you know, Strange New Worlds has um, expanded 
on, on the that. ideology of. Yeah, yeah, I mean, which, it, uh, yeah. Well, in Enterprise, to Paul called it something of an experiment when she hooked up with Trip. Well, thank you. I've been all I've been wanting to explore human sexuality. Like, what a way to slap somebody down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being my guinea pig trip is basically what she was saying. <laughs> Again, I haven't seen that episode, so I think I have to figure out what the uh, the results were of that one. But don't don't ruin it. Don't ruin it. Uh, I'm just want I I want to say it's definitely third season. It's not Harbinger, but if you're gonna go looking, look in the third season. It's got to be an episode pretty much maybe right after Harbinger because Harbinger okay. is kind of what brings it to a head, and I think the incident happens one or two episodes after harbinger i think i have to wait three years because uh on our podcast mission log we are season two i believe of voyager although i'm behind on that as well i'll oh, just so skip we're, ahead we're doing it chronologically <laughs> <laughs> i know i know I'm, I'm not a voyager got, fan any of voyager episodes that i've got to catch up on now too i i'm not a fan of voyager but but like you said i mean they it's one of those things it took star trek or yeah it took star trek that long to get to a female captain when it's something that, you know, because, and, and it goes, it goes, it also speaks to how long it took them to put LGBTQ representation in. It took longer than a lot of people think it should, think yep. it should, thought it should have. Yep. But yep. it was tough. I and, I, and I think I've read in a couple places where your, your dad would have been more than willing to do something earlier had Paramount, I think, was more of the, was more reticent than he was to explore that. There are certain fights he could fight, and listen, I don't know this for a fact, but this is what I've heard, and, uh, you know, the, there's, um, there was, I'm sure, a concern that there was a demographic out there that they would lose if they mm -hmm. went too far in that direction, and I think it was a balance. They did, they did push the envelope for a while with certain things. Right, but it was... I, I don't know what this beeping is. I don't either. Sorry. That's okay. If it keeps happening. Um, anyhow, uh, yeah, so I... I Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it was all, up until Strange New, up until Discovery, it was all very metaphorical, which is great, because it was something. Yeah. But I, I, you know, and you're right, you have, there's battles that you have to fight. You know, he, the, um, the episode with the interracial kiss got banned in so many, so he knew, you know, yeah. and, and, I, and, I, and I believe I had read somewhere that he and George Takei had had conversations, and, you know, basically, I want to, but I can't. Yeah. You know, there are just some battles that, that, you know, it, it's, it's, I do this, I try to win this battle and I lose the war because I lose the show. Yep. That's, it's well, very well put. Um, I, I don't know that exactly happening, but I have no doubt something like that did happen. And I know what that sound is. Excuse me. Sure. Good time for the podcast. Yep. <laughs> All right. Planned on everything, but the dryer stopping. <laughs> Just right. proving that everybody has laundry to do, no matter who you are in this world. Exactly. Uh, what does Faith have to say? Putting up the money are always going to be conservative ones. It makes sense for thankfully. Time. Yes, this this is very true. Oh, and Faith also loves Strange New Worlds. So do I. I think it's fabulous. I think the casting. I think Ethan Peck is doing wonderfully to pay tribute to Leonard Nimoy's Spock. All the cast, uh, and I'm not just saying this because I work on it. They're all doing an incredible job. I mean, I, they they really hit it out of the park with Strange New Worlds, and and not to say the other shows haven't, um, but clearly this is the show that that is a little bit more similar to, of course, the original series, and and dare I say, little bits of Next Generation. So it's hitting home for more people. It's it's more identifiable. It's easier to relate to, um, and and again, the stories are excellent as well. But I, yeah. I certainly don't want to take away. Um, Discovery has had one hell of a journey uh, finding its way, um, and it's it's been nice because every season has been significantly different. Uh, which I mean, some people might be pros and cons because it might be nice to find an identity of a show and connect it, that identity and follow it. And I know Discovery has had multiple identities and then jumped eight hundred years into the future, and then you know so. But but I, I do think it's on the right course, and I am really proud of, of uh, especially season three and four. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of times it takes that long for a show to find its footing, but um, I've I've enjoyed them. I love Booker. I love the cat. That's my favorite. 
Yeah. And, yeah, and Sonic Sonic Cat incredible. person. Oh, Sonequa, Sonequa actually, awesome. I had the pleasure of meeting Sonequa at um, a convention here. It was called Walker Stalker. So she was still in, and she was there representing her Walking Dead character. But I think the first season of Discovery had just aired or, or had just finished. It was in the middle. And she is so wonderful. I went up to her and I, and I told her, I said, and I, and I meant it with my entire heart. Her portrayal of a human raised by Vulcans, I thought, was spot on. I really did. I thought I thought she did a fabulous job um, picking up on that. Um, I think she's becoming a little more human now. That you know, but that makes sense. Yeah. Cons considering the circumstances, um, so I think everybody's storylines are pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and like you said, Strange New Worlds is amazing. And of course, you know, let's not leave out, everyone loves Lower Decks by all means, but another hidden gem that, that I think people, a lot of people aren't watching is Prodigy. Prodigy's um, great. Okay, so you've seen it. So they, they initially geared it for kids, but okay, and just my luck, I've got someone at the door. This will be interesting. <laughs> this will be interesting. Well, everyone, live show. This is what you get with a live this show. This is what you get with live, huh, guys? This is great, though, but this just means he owes me however long it takes him to be exactly. at the door. Hi. Good. I don't know. Just in the love call. What's up? Yeah, no worries. What's up? I wonder if it's like uh, Jehovah's Perfect. Witnesses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers, man. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Lasso yeah. wants to know if it's Avon calling. It's not a one calling. I, I'm uh, I'm I'm staying in, in uh, a, a different, a, a unique place to me in my parking spot that I was supposed to take. Someone was in, and I asked them. Uh, I said, "Someone's there. I can park somewhere else." But they were just letting me know the spot's clear. All important stuff. All important stuff. Um, so Lasso also wants to know if you bought any Powerball tickets because it's like one point uh, nine million billion. It, I should. I should. Right? Because everyone's doing it. I just, you know, just be my luck if I won. Um, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying. Well, I, I'm just saying 1.919, and your dad's birthday was August 19th. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, my, my best friend's birthday is August 19th, so kind of, and he's a Trek fan as well. So and Jonathan just, Frakes. And Jonathan Frakes, yeah. And Bill Clinton, too, that's a complete line. I just happen to know, like, those, and, um, Diana Muldar, I think, also. Oh, but wow. I am not a fan of her, so I tend to not recognize that. I didn't... Gotcha. Yeah. Um, she has never played a character that I've ever liked. I don't know how she is as a human being. I will tell you. But did not like Pulaski. Didn't like the two characters she played in the original, in the original series. Yeah. But... Okay. I thought she was a good doctor while we, while we didn't have uh, Beverly Crusher. But um, I'm glad well, we got Beverly back. Yeah, no, I think, um, and I, I've told this story before, but uh, you haven't heard it. I was actually at the New York, at Creations New York Star Trek convention back in the day when they used to do slideshow presentations. Right. And it was between the second and the third season. And they're clicking through all these TNG slides to tell everybody what's coming up for the third season. And it stops and there's a blank screen. And the guy, whoever was, was running the show says, and now to introduce you to the new doctor for the third season of Star Trek Next Generation, and they bring up a slide of Bit Beverly. And the crowd went completely wild. Yeah. It was so amazing. I actually had a chance to tell uh, Gates that story a few years ago. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what else we got. Faith is talking about, yes, to Pring. Yeah. It was very, di she's very different in uh, Strange New Worlds than she is in. Uh, was in TOS, but we didn't really get a lot of to bring, you know. Yeah, I was I was conflicted about the Vulcan portrayal. I mean, it's a it's it's a good. I, I think every creative person is doing an incredible job of doing their best to stick with canon. Uh, and and listen, I I know boundaries are being pushed in that area. That something may irk some of us sometimes, and and it happens to me too. And. You know, the way I've always seen Vulcans are they are very logical. They are they are pretty this cold uh, one. I don't want to say one dimensional, um, but they can be very cold one dimensional characters with that don't express emotion. And, uh, you know, we start to see a little bit behind the scenes of a, of a relationship. 
on on Vulcan, or at least between two Vulcans. And I, I I've been a little conflicted by that because the more human they become, or at least the more those relationships are seen and, and identifiable as human uh, feelings and qualities, the less Vulcan they become. So I'm, I'm but I, I haven't heard anyone else complain about it. So I That's am, an interesting, yeah. Honestly, I think I, I, I look at things very closely. I'm, I'm, when it comes to Star Trek, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm almost the worst person to talk to because I am so myopic. I am so uh, laser focused. It, it is so hard for me to see the bigger picture sometimes. Um, so I, I love getting input from other people. I think for me, um, I liked, like I said, Amok Time was my favorite episode. So the fact that they brought Dupring in, I was excited. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was very interested to see to see where they were going. Now, they're sort of nipping away in Amok Time because um, I can quote verbatim some of the lines. And one of them being when Nurse Chapel says to Mr. Spock when Dupring's up on the screen. And she says, oh, she's lovely, Mr. Spock. Who is she? And Spock says my fiance or my wife, or I think he says my wife. And you watch Chapel's face just crumble mm-hmm. when he says that. And obviously they've taken, that's not the case anymore. Now that we're in strange new worlds because obviously Chapel and to know each other. So yeah. I, that, that, I mean, I, it's like, I love the fact that they brought her in, but now I'm a little annoyed because now you're messing with, with something that's, you know, been Timeline in place. And, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I struggle with that as well. Um, and there's certain things I struggle with and certain things I just, I let go. Um, and right. I'm sure we all have versions of that on, on all sides. But, you know, if we're up to me entirely, and it's it's not even up to me at all, by the way, um, just for everyone knows, oh, I, I'm going to do a quick, quick discussion here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and there are some out there, people think that the minute my father passed away, I took over. There's people out there who think I did Deep Space Nine and Voyager and Enterprise. Uh, just to clear the air, I, I, I did none of those. I, again, I was a kid at the time, and it was Rick Berman and, and tons of other incredibly talented people who did those shows. Um, I'm an executive producer on all of the five new shows that are out right now. Uh, however, uh, I, I, am not, um, I am not like the lead creative involved who's developing these things. I am a tier or two out where... There is a core group of creatives. Alex Kurtzman is really the visionary behind a lot of these things. And he brings in a lot of talented people to create these stories and come up with these stories. And while we have a seat at the table and we share our points of view, um, uh, I am not the one developing these shows personally. Um, so, so, so I said all that because what I was about to say, if I can remember what I was about to say, uh, I think it had something more to do along the lines of, I watch these shows, I read the scripts, I share notes when I feel they're relevant and when I think they're really uh, maybe intruding on timelines or, or, or hurting canon. Uh, but they do have a lot of great people already observing canon. And I think these are conscious choices to expand characters. And so you're going to have to just, well, no one has to do anything, but if you're going to watch it, you're going to have to just uh, suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> and realize and fudge that little timeline and the characters right. and all that. It's, right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one. Right. If it were up to me, I wouldn't want to break any of yeah. those things. Right. But. Okay. So Faith likes. Not the, always easy. Yeah. Faith likes the flirting between Scott and Chapel. I, I enjoy that on Strange New Worlds. I think that's, I think that's yeah. really, you know, it lends, it, it's a little bit, I mean, because. In TOS Chapel, you always kind of, I think, felt a little sorry for her because it was very unrequited one way because Spock just was Spock. So yeah. so at least I, I don't have a problem with them rewriting it to make it a little more double-sided mm-hmm. for for Christine in in Strange New Worlds. Um, mm-hmm. Stand what makes sense, but from a life POV, knowing more about others humanizes them. That's human. Yep, that's human. Not Her Vulcan. point, she's got, we do it with the dogs. That's what it takes away from the power. What makes us human. Yeah. 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 Excellent points, Faith. But, um, yeah, so Prodigy, I am a fan of Prodigy. I love, the one of the things I wanted to say about Prodigy is that the way it was 
they succeeded in what they wanted to do, which was make something for children and make something accessible for children. But if you're a Star Trek, if you're an adult Star Trek fan, it does not talk down to you or your children. And I think, I think, you know, television now can't talk down to kids. I think kids are way more advanced than they were when I was growing up. And I think, I think it needs to be intelligent and speak to them. And it does one of the things that everybody that watches this show knows I am a huge fan of, which is if you've got something to say, you do it organically. Don't shove it down my throat. Don't make it, make it part of the story. Don't, don't make it so that I can see right away that you're trying to make some sort of big moral point. Um, I think one of the best things, and they did it right off the bat, was with Rock, mm-hmm. where you see Rock and Rock's grunting and making all the big. So you assume, I think, right? I think a lot of people that I know I did, mm-hmm. that Rock is male. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, when the Universal Translator kicks in, you realize, yeah, I'm wrong. And I think that that was a great way to show, talk about making assumptions. Yeah. About no, people. You, you, you just said that beautifully. You just mm-hmm. said that beautifully. That, that is what is perfect about Prodigy. It does not shove it down your throat. It tells a great story. And you're absolutely right. And throughout the, these stories, there are messages peppered in that you don't necessarily see until you've had a moment and can reflect and go like, huh. I didn't think about it that way, or I didn't consider that, or I was surprised by that. So you are absolutely right. That is when Star Trek is at its best, is when it's not shoving things down your throat. But you right. are hopefully broadening your perspectives watching it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Faith is a school teacher. So she said, I've been loving- oh, that is great. Mm. I'm so glad. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, he's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I love, yeah, I think, I think all the characters are really well drawn in Prodigy. Um, I love Lower Decks um, for the silliness. You know, what's really funny is Lower Decks is geared towards adults, and it's definitely sillier than Prodigy. But, yes. it, but it's a fun sort of silly. Um, they're amping up the Enterprise references, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, but it's, it's their animation, you know, animation for adults has been around since the Flintstones. So I think it's great that Star Trek is, just, you know, I, I mean, there's a lot of animation out now that's geared towards adults. And I am glad that Star Trek sure. has decided to do that. Um, and again, just an incredible cast. And it's just, yeah. it's so much fun to watch because it's Star Trek poking fun at itself in a lot of yeah. ways. And they're, they're doing a good job of writing that line of making it uh, good for n- new, new people who don't know Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And of right. course the insider baseball with all the references. I mean, Lower Decks, that was the concern. Is it is it too much of the references that new people won't get? But it sounds like there are people who can enjoy it, even if they yeah, don't straight- know all the references. They're straight out. I mean, the one episode with the Ferengi and like the Horgon statue that just flies by. It was a perfect little Easter egg. It's like, if you've mm-hmm. never watched Star Trek before, it's just some statue. But if you've watched Star Trek before, then you're like, oh, look, there goes a Horgon. So, you know, it's little things like that. There's little Easter eggs that make it fun. But like you said, it's not... So much of an insider joke that it's going to turn somebody off yeah. because they're not even going to realize it. Lost. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They won't get lost. Travis, it's okay that you're late. Um, did you ever get to meet Lucille Ball? No, I did not. Um, I don't know when she, I was definitely alive, of course, but uh, oh, yeah. no, you know, I, I, and here's, these are the things, you know, when someone ever makes a question like, or asks a question like, you know, what would you say to your father? Or would you ever like that? What would you want to talk to your father about? They, I would love to sit down with my father as an adult and ask him a lot of these questions. And some of them, you know, most of them probably just about life and, and religion and politics and women and marriage and, and all, you know, all these bigger topics, but I, I would, you know, he, he obviously met and knew Lucille Ball because she was the one that greenlit the original series. Um, I, I'd like to know how that went. I'd like to know, because cause as I think most people know, every season of the original series was a struggle and whether it was going to come back or not. And it was always a fight to get it back on the air. And it was not a success. And, and I think, you know, from Lucille Ball's point of view, even though she took a chance on this guy, um, I, I think in that one time frame, 66, or granted it was probably 64 to 69, mm-hmm. um, it, it was a failure. 
And I would love to have heard, like, what was your relationship with Lucille Ball in, in 69? Did she write you off or did she see the genius and thought everyone was crazy? But unfortunately, I had to go. You know, I, I'd like to know right. what became of that. I um, One of the things I love about Chat Pack 2.0 is that somebody will probably look this up for me. If I say, somebody tell me what year Lucille Ball died, please. Um, that way, nobody has to watch my resting research face while I try to look something up on my own and talk to you at the same time. Um, I would like to know, if I had had the chance, is if if she was alive long enough to understand what she did. That even though at the time, in the moment, the show was a failure, did she at least get to see that she was right? That that what she helped build has continued. You know, like your dad got your dad got to do. You know, at least he got to start the next generation and kind of see that through. And and he got to see that it was it really was starting to have an impact and it was starting to roll. See, Lasso, love you. Oh my gosh, I didn't know she died on your birthday. But yeah, oh, wow. eighty nine and next gen premiered on what, eighty six? Eighty seven. Eighty seven, I believe. Eighty yes. seven. So I mean maybe she had an inkling if she was paying attention or you know had any uh, yeah, idea. If that... she was paying attention and I you know, maybe that was uh yeah. I, you know, e even my father who died in season five of Next Generation, you know, I I, I think I think he got to have that second sort of feeling of uh, now I've succeeded because I think mm -hmm. really the first series was a constant fight, as I said, and I think it, it was a failure. Now he didn't look at it as a failure, sure. but it, it, it ended, that was it. And then the movies came along and you know what? The motion picture, no one really liked and, and they, they took him off of the movies. So they did movies like the wrath of Khan. And even though he was a consultant and sent in notes, he, they, those weren't his. And I think, you know, there was a sense of, I don't want to say failure, but somewhat of a failure. Now he went to conventions and he talked to fans. So he saw that there were people out there who believed in that better future like he did. But of course, it wasn't until Next Generation that he really got to experience that. And as we've gone on since then, um, I, I would love for him to know that it's still going on. And, and here's what I think about, whether it's him or Lucille Ball or anyone else who's been involved. I truly do believe that 100, 200, 500 years from now, there will be Star Trek in some form. Now, I can't even predict what movies or TV or if there will even be movies or TV in 100 right. years. Like, you'll just be in it or something. But the, the callbacks to this show that came from the 1960s that talked about this better future, it'll always be referred to. And, right. you know... 20 years from now, there will be another Star Trek. And it, it might dip. Like all these shows that are on right now, I don't know how long it's going to run. Five more years, 10 more years. But at some point, it will dip. And by that, I mean either all go off the air or disappear for a while. But then it will come back because someone's going to say, hey, wasn't there that Star Trek show? Which is what you know happened here. <laughs> People are like, hey, we should do more Star Trek. <laughs> Faith wants you to know that she adored Earth Final oh. Conflict. Wow, that's great. Earth Funnel Conflict, another great concept uh, that was <laughs> based. I wish that show had more continuity. Yes, so that is exactly what I was about to say. Um, it, it was based off some concepts of my father. It was reconfigured and jiggered, and they took some characters and some things, and, and they made – it was came from something called Battle – hold on, I can't get it wrong. Battleground Earth, not to be confused with Battlefield Earth. Battlefield Earth was the Scientology uh, uh, book that, uh, what's his name, wrote, and my father had no connection with him. Battleground Earth, completely unrelated, was a completely different sci-fi show. We decided to change the name because we didn't want it to be associated with uh, Scientology, and it became Earth Funnel Conflict. Anyhow, giving you all this background stuff that you may not have wanted to know. Um, it had a great first season. It was rough like any first season. All shows, many shows, sometimes have a shaky start. It was still good, but a shaky start. Unfortunately, in season two, they decided to get rid of the main character and bring in a new lead, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, the new lead was a fantastic actor, just as the old, but it's hard to do that to an audience. And so right. you're right. The continuity went 
every different direction. And that, that somewhat was the kiss of death. Oh no, I always want to know all those things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of people, yeah, I think, I think, um, let's see. But it went five oh, seasons, not- so I can't say <laughs> it was a complete failure. It was a success. Right. Just so Battlefield, yeah. Was- okay, uh, let's see what else we got. See, we all love the background. Yes. I wrote my first research paper in school about your dad in Star Trek. There you go. Oh, wow. Nice. What, what was the subject, if you don't mind me asking, of that research paper? Just historical or anything in particular? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Go ahead, Faith. Start typing. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, you had mentioned earlier, you know, you're not your dad. And, you know, you don't know how he thinks or how he feels um, what really always... I have some pretty close speculations. And I think right, exactly. Like if anybody's going to... Right. If anybody's going to have... Yeah. Because what, what's always cracked me up, and this is kind of kind of leads around to the Orville, because you and I have talked about the Orville before. Wow. Um, you know, all these people, you know, they're hating on the Orville. Or... Who's hating on the Orville? Oh. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> But, you know, you know, and how it's, it's a farce and how it's this. And, and I remember the first time that you and I met um, was at the bar in the Masquerade Bar at the Rio. Mm-hmm. Um, you came over, you were talk- I was with uh, Raymond Litster and you came over and we were chatting. And one of the first things I've been dying to ask you, because like, because you could get to a close approximation is I asked you if you thought the Orville was a love letter to your dad. And you said yes. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say I know for a fact, but just right. under I know for a fact, um, while I'm not buddy-buddy with Seth MacFarlane, I've sure. had the privilege of speaking to him once or twice, and he has said everything but it's a love letter to the next generation. Um, he is an absolute fan and loves the next generation. I mean, yes. it is his show, and, and so... Anybody who watches Family Guy should know that. Yes, and so I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb by by saying um, Seth MacFarlane definitely wrote Orville as a love letter to the next generation, and he has knocked it out of the park uh, in terms of of great stories that make you think and consider different points of view. He is pushing the envelope, and he's doing it in a fun way. Um, I, I highly recommend those of you out there who might have heard it's not good or whatever, please give it a shot. Um, it, it is, it, and if you like Star Trek and the next generation, you should like this. Maybe you don't like the comedy side of it. I don't know to each their own, but it is great storytelling. It's turned into this, this last season on Hulu. He's pulled back on the comedy. It's more of a dramedy now than a full fledged sci-fi comedy. Uh, I think I see somebody sneaking in the back there. There is somebody in the back there. Yeah. He's, he's okay. We'll he's gone. Right but you called it. You did say he was going to pop in. So there he was. And there he went. You want to come say hi, kiddo? He's like, no. Dad's on no. another interview. He's probably, he's probably mad that we saw him at this point. Oh, he's... <laughs> uh, uh, and there hi. he is. Everyone, how are this you? Is Roddenberry. Oh, he can't hear you. But they're saying, how are you? Good. Good. He was sick. He still is uh, getting his voice back. But, oh, uh, feel better good. soon. They're saying feel better, kiddo. Thanks for popping in. Thank you. They said thanks for popping in. Or something. Oh, wait, hold on. He can see this, though, all right? Faith sends hearts. <laughs> we see it. You don't want to say anything loud, kiddo, so they can hear you? you got to say it right here where the microphone is. Hi. All right. That's my, my boy. He's Love adorable. You, He's a good one. Somehow I lucked out. Up, oh, Travis says get well soon. So, yeah, everybody here hopes he feels better. Oh, thank you. They all hope you feel better soon, kiddo. Okay, so, okay. Faith, <laughs> to answer your question, seventh grade, how to read a book and. The focus, I think. How to read a book and cite sources was the focus. But it's where I learned about Lucille Ball helping to get TOC. Oh, TOS, maybe. Yeah. What is it? Dessert. Oh, dessert. Well, give me a little bit of time, kiddo. We'll get you dessert in just a bit. What's on the menu? I have to figure that out. I will not say it's too late. I will not say it's too late. 
and and we're all witnesses to that. So if he doesn't get his dessert, you know, we all heard I'm you trouble. say, uh, yeah, yeah. I expect you to report back. It's gonna be. I, I see yeah. Uh, the other the other fun the other funny uh rod roddenberry story i personally have <laughs> there's a lot of those if you know yeah me. um don't know you well enough to have more than two but this other one is just that um in vegas this year uh my group lambda quadrant we were co-hosting the nubian solo meetup event and we invited larry nemich i never can get his last name right nemichek yeah it's, Nemec it's unique. yeah um we invited him to do some trivia for prizes. So he was calling out to So one of the, one of the trivia questions was where did Wesley Crusher get his name? And somebody answered it and it was, and he got it right. And it was so loud and I was doing so many different things. It didn't kind of register. And then a couple days later, we're chatting at the, at the cocktail party. And I asked you to be on the show and you said, here's my, my email address. And you started to give it to me and you're like, E W as in Wesley. And I went, Wesley, right. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, that's where Wesley well, Crusher goes. Well, not necessarily just for me. Uh, my, I'm a junior. And, and as I learned, junior means there's a senior. And that usually means you have basically the same name. So my father's legal name was also Eugene Wesley Roddenberry, just like mine. Oh. Um, he, he, you know, took the abbreviation or uh, the abbreviation. He took the short name or the, the nickname Gene. Um, he actually, they called him Rod during World War II, uh, I, I was told. And then after that, he took the name Gene Roddenberry. And then uh, I guess he, they just brought me up as a kid on, as Rod. Uh, but it does get confusing because I'm everywhere I go, I'm billed officially as Eugene Roddenberry. And then I introduce myself as Rod. So there's a lot of people out there who think there's two of us, like I have a brother. <laughs> but it works. I mean, that can work to my benefit. If I ever do anything bad, if I ever get, you know, in trouble in, in the social media space, I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, that was wrong. I'm Eugene. That's that guy's terrible. Just don't even talk to him. Um, I know the answer to this question, but uh, the answer is no. If you want to tell us all what your son's name is. Is my son number three? As in like Eugene Roddenberry. Oh, gotcha. Sorry. And and that would help. Um, no. So <laughs> I decided to break that mold. He he is his own person, uh, obviously. Um, his name is Zale Eugene Roddenberry. And the reason why we kept... So we went with Zale, not to give you too much of the story here, but single syllable, uh, unique, but not too weird. Um, it means power of the sea in Greek. We're not Greek, but we love the ocean. And, and there were a lot of other names that we decided not to go with. And it was... It was, it was just kind of the one that we landed on. Eugene was obviously my father's first name, my first name. And, and Heidi, Zale's mom, it, it was uh, her father's middle name. So the fact that we both had Eugene in our family, oh, well, we've well, got to keep that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So see, there you go, Rod and yeah. Eugene. You're, it's your mirror universe whenever anybody, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, mirror, the mirror guy. Um, ha ha enterprise joke. He's not a trip. I love, I love it. Faith. That's awesome. John, thank you so much for joining us. So glad you're here. Um, and Linda says, I, I said that too. When I found out his name was, I thought that was great. Cause it's unique. It is unique. It is unique. Zale is, yeah. Doesn't really fall in line with the whole Roddenberry thing, but you know, doesn't always have to, whatever well, he wants to be when he grows up, whether it's uh, anything from a, uh, a, a, a dancer to a writer to a, a I don't hope I mean he can be a gas station attendant I whatever it is I hope he's passionate I, I literally do not care if he wants to to be a a lawnmower repair guy that is the best lawnmower repair guy in the world by all means do it. <laughs> No, that's great. And and like I said, we were having this discussion before. That's kind of how that was your parents kind of style. Like they they just wanted you to be the best you you could be. They didn't they really um they didn't point you in any direction. No, no. They they not really. Except I, by I making you a PA. Replaced. Yes. <laughs> and at a young age I learned how to rebel, which is uh, not necessarily the best thing. Mm. Oh, Faith, you relate to the game. I don't know if you saw my shirt, but it, it got here. We were talking about it last week. Single, taken, mentally dating Malcolm Reed. So it got here. 
Aw, Linda says you're a great dad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's probably moments. that's the most important part or most important job. Oh, in my life, for sure. Yeah. And, and one that I, I need the most help with and the most uh, uh, training in. Oh, Travis says she always thought Angel was amazing. Mm -hmm. What was she like behind the scenes? Oh, my mother. My mother was, um, you know, uh, so my mother was a bit of a sailor. And in that sense, she was a headstrong woman. Um, yeah, yeah, she was somewhat of the typical housewife in terms of when I was growing up, um, but certainly by no means docile and, and, and subdued. She, but she, she spoke her own mind. A quick, couple of quick stories here. Um, my parents were members of a golf club. They, they enjoyed golf, and they were members of a club that I'm not sure why they were members, and it wasn't a bad club, but um, it was the Bel Air Country Club, and, and – uh, prestigious and all that, but, you know, um, very white um, and, uh, you know, a lot of um, and, and conservatives, not bad, but certainly a lot of conservative points of view and stuff. And, that. and it just doesn't necessarily seem to fit their personas, but they, they had a lot of friends there. And, and I mean, you can, you, you can have friends who have different ideas than you. Anyhow, all this is to say, um, the, the club had, uh, what is it? Thursdays was the men's grill. No women were allowed in the, in the one grill, the restaurant. And my mother said, screw that. And she would go in there, not being a feminist, exactly. Not saying like, I am a woman and I deserve to be in here. She went in there because she wanted to sit with the guys and tell the exact same dirty, <laughs> she, she wanted to be horrible and tell dirty jokes and rude and she didn't smoke cigars, but of course they were all smoking cigars. And so she just sort of had that personality as well. You couldn't offend her. So she would speak her mind. And, and I was always very impressed with that. She really didn't let anyone walk all over her, um, which I, I love her for that. Which I know is probably my father did too. I was going to say, which is probably what made the relationship with your dad work because you had said, yeah. um, and obviously we were talking before Luoxana is one of my favorite Star Trek characters out of all of them. Um, just such a multifaceted character. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and it was the episodes where you got to glimpse past the flirtatious, ostentatious, you know, I am the holder of the sacred chalice of Reese. When you got behind that curtain and you got to see how deep her emotions run and how deep of a person she was and how deeply she felt, those were such amazing episodes. You know, the, the, that character, for all intents and purposes, is her. Um, it, it, in a way, I mean, the, the same way that that character didn't take no for an answer and would insert herself in conversation. I guess my mother wasn't that over the top. She wouldn't necessarily harass anyone <laughs> like, like a captain. Um, and she wouldn't necessarily insert herself in conversations, but again, she spoke her mind and, um, and, and, and it wasn't in an effort to be offensive or to say, I am woman, hear me roar. It was just to say, I have an opinion on this and I'm not going to let you ignore me because I'm a woman. She was, yeah, she was just true to herself and who she was. Yeah. Uh, I grew yeah. up with TNG, but the vulnerability of DS9 Luxana was my favorite. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. I just saw that episode, uh, the elevator with the elevator with um, Odo. And just yeah. when she takes off her wig and just is so beautiful. It's so yeah. beautiful. No, when you, you get let in behind the curtain. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what I'm dark not. page is, Travis. So, yep. Odo and the Togo are left. Yep. 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 <clears throat> um, don't want to get Jean, don't want Jean's question to kind of get lost. Uh oh. Um, we kind of covered this. Trick shows. Do you think they are moving away from your father's original vision? Uh, we did talk a little bit about that, not that question specifically, but I will, I will speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, just like anyone out there, I grew up with Star Trek. So I grew up with The Next Generation, and, and that's my <laughs> series. And that's still my series. That's not to say I don't love what's out right now. I, I do love what's out right now. 
But it is to say that, yeah, I look at certain episodes or certain uh, story points and I go like, huh, I'm not sure that fits with my view of Star Trek or at least how I would do it or at least how I, I think it should go. Um, not to say anything is counter. Uh, there's certainly nothing in there that's counter. Um, we'd all do things differently. Uh, but I, 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 I see these new shows as the next step. Um, next Generation was very different from the original series just as Discovery and Strange New Worlds and, and Picard are very different from The Next Generation uh, and those shows that followed it. Um, there's a new group of people that are doing a very good job. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. No one is. But a very good job of staying with canon. And at some points, they're, they're, they recognize that they're stepping outside of canon, but they're trying to give the characters a little bit more... Uh, uh, something more to chew on and, and to bring characters together, as we were discussing earlier, Stephanie, about um, uh, uh, to Pring and, and mm -hmm. Spock. Um, so do I think it's stepping away? No. Is it what my father would do? Not exactly, but would he be proud of it? 100%. 100%. Um, if we want to nitpick, are there certain things that he might say he wouldn't do? Sure. I mean, like I said, there's, there's things that I wouldn't do. There's things that you wouldn't do. Uh, and that's, that's fine. They're, they're just little things here and there. But that's, that's, that's in everything. Um, I, I truly love these shows. And, uh, um, and honestly, I mean, after 50 plus years, sometimes it's kind of hard to, well, you, you know, you, like go back and, you know, things that, look, this is like Faith. Faith is saying it better than I am. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard to do the same thing over again. You know, no one would be happy if they went on and did, you know, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and then whatever, you know, that, that stamp of whatever would be next following that line. Um, people might just say it's, it's too much like those. So, and what I'm really proud of is that all five of these shows that are out right now are so incredibly different. It's okay if you don't like one of them or two of them or three of them. Yeah. I've said if you that. like Star Trek, you'll probably find and identify something in one of them that you'll like. It just depends on how picky of a Star Trek fan you are. Well, I, I mean, honestly, that it's a Kobayashi Maru. It is an absolutely a no-win scenario. Because mm -hmm. if you go in one direction, you're going to please some people. You go in another, you're never going to please everybody. But again, like you said, there's so much out there. And I have said this so many times on this show. There's so much. You can love it, hate it, love it. The only thing that you cannot do, and the only thing that will set me off, is you can tell me you don't like something, but do not ever tell me that it is not Star Trek because you don't get to make that call. Mm -hmm. You don't have to love it. You don't ever have to watch it. I will tell you plenty of times, I am not a Voyager fan. That doesn't mean I'm running around saying Voyager isn't Star Trek. Paramount made it. You know, everybody that was involved, it's Star Trek. So... You know, I think it's very disrespectful when people say that's not Star Trek because who died and left you like the arbiter of what is or isn't? You and, know? It's, and it may not be Star Trek to their vision of Star, and that's I mean, exactly that's fine. That's exactly. Fine. Um, there's like, yeah, yeah. There, there's episodes out there on from the original series, Next Gen, Deep Space, all the way up to the current stuff that I would say oh, that's not a very good representation of Star Trek. But um, all right, I mean, yeah. It's just it's it, it it's all Star Trek. I mean, even even the 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 JJ Abrams. Oh my God, I happen to like the JJ Abrams movies. I think they're I, great. I, I, yes, I think they were well cast. Yes, incredibly well cast. Um, again, first one sort of screwed up a muck time by blowing up Vulcan, but that's okay. Um, but well, it's a different, it's a different timeline. timeline. Yeah, yeah, it's a different, a different timeline. timeline. That uh, that was one way around. Uh, uh, running over canon. Um, yeah. Right. Oh, Faith is a Trek glutton. That's so funny. I love that. <laughs> yeah, but just yeah. look at it this way. You'll have plenty to rewatch. That's a good point. <laughs> you can start all over again. Yeah, on exactly. Our, on our podcast, we're going through each ep episode. Of everything. Yeah. And we calculated that before the new stuff came out. So the end of Enterprise to take 14 years. Oh wow! And that's doing one a week, of course. Right. So, uh, so uh, anyone who who, whenever these current run of shows end, whether that's five years, ten years, twenty years, there's plenty to go back to. 
Linda, I watch it every night on Heroes and Icons because I fall asleep to it waiting for Enterprise to come on. Still don't like it. <laughs> I like characters. I think I think Seven of Nine is a fascinating character. I think Neelix is hysterical. Um, it just never resonated with me. And I have been watching it, and it still doesn't resonate with me, and that's okay. That's yeah. okay. I mean, the fact that they brought in a female captain, I think, you know, like I said earlier, it was about time that it happened. So, you know, and there's, and there's like one or two episodes I might actually like. Uh, but as a whole, I'm just not a Voyager person. And that's yeah. okay. Rod said it's okay. So <laughs> I, I think it's okay, whatever anyone's belief is. I have my own issues. You know, Deep Space Nine is, I certainly do not think it's a bad show. I certainly do think it's Star Trek. Um, but I'm right. a little bit of a traditionalist in my heroes. I, I want to root for my hero, and I want them to to go, do good. They can make mistakes, but uh, but I, ultimately I want them to be that sort of Superman heroic sort of character in the end. And I, I do find uh, many of the characters charming in Deep Space Nine, but I don't know if I'm rooting for them. I'm certainly not rooting against them. It's just... Right. Everyone has sort of, and dark's too strong of a word, but their darker side. And, and I, 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 I don't like to think of humanity that way, even though it's more realistic. Even the current Star Trek show the darker side of humans. Sadly, that's easier for us to identify with and connect to these days because, well, there is a darker side of humanity. Right. Um, and there always has been, not that there wasn't in the 60s. Um, but I prefer to see that 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 better representation of who we could be, and um, and and be inspired by that, and I think people would counter what I just said by saying that is in Deep Space Nine. That's what those characters are doing, and they well, may for you, and they may for you. Well, Faith thinks you're misunderstanding Cisco. I, and and I'm and I'm fair, fair. It says I think you're understanding misunderstanding Cisco. I think he's a hero, maybe more Batman than Superman, but I love it, right? And so I am more of a Superman fan. And I don't dislike Batman, but I've, I've never liked that, you know, I have to, to work in the shadows and I, I have to do the dirty and dark stuff to, to, to clean up society or to, or to get rid of the bad guys. I, my, my vision of it is a little too, and people might say Pollyannish and unrealistic. And you're absolutely right. I'm just talking about that idealistic future of what we could be, not the reality of who we are today. There are plenty of great people and there are heroes. Um, and, and dare I say, I don't even think there's villains. I, I, I don't want to say there's no villains, but I don't think anyone is just pure evil. Although that's a whole nother discussion. Right. Well, you, you, you got me with the Superman. I'm a huge Superman. Huge oh, yeah. Superman. Christopher Reeve is my Superman. Has always yep. been my Superman. But yeah, there was definitely a purity of purpose with him that, yeah, that because I think it does tend to stand kind of above who most people are, you know, yeah. doesn't drink, you know, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, always tells the truth. You know, is that, I mean, yeah. not, not the easiest thing for some of us, myself right. included, but, um, but I, I wouldn't mind being that as opposed to Batman. Right. I, I would rather be Superman than Batman. Let's put it that way. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't believe I'm arguing about it. <laughs> there's, well, there's no argument. There's no argument. I, it's just I love discussion. Yes, yes. Um, well, Faith, if you ever can figure out a way to make yourself make it out to uh, Vegas, uh, are, Rod, are you planning on 2023? You're usually around somewhere. I, sh I should be there. I should be there. See? So you could actually talk to him about Star Trek in person. Buy him a drink at the Masquerade Bar and it'll all be good, right? I'm happy to do it. <laughs> um. But you know what's funny is is I do I love Superman I mean I like Batman but I love Superman yet I'm a huge fan of Section Thirty One. Ooh, well we're gonna we're gonna bump up against each other there. <laughs> yeah, that that falls oh, yeah. right into what I was saying. I I don't like even though it's been established and I think it was was established in Deep Space Nine or Voyager. I don't know the first time. Uh, it was Deep Space Nine, right? Well, I don't know. I, I don't like there being this dark and nefarious side of, of the Federation it, that, that has to work in the shadows and, and do all the things that, that the Federation can't be seen doing. Right. Um, I see, and I would disagree because I think, I think I agree with the philosophy. If you want that utopian future, 
sometimes, you know, you've got to have this side that's not afraid to get its hands dirty. And I'm going to, I mean, I'll admit, you know, the whole Malcolm Reed being in section 31 things probably what tipped me over, but, um, <laughs> I'm just hoping I, we get all that done before we get to enterprise, like between now and, and enterprise in our, in our human history, that's when all the nefarious thing is right and happen. And then when we decide to, to introduce ourselves or be introduced to aliens and be better then we right. should be better. But the whole entire third season of Enterprise showed, I think, that that's kind of naive. You know, you watched Archer go from that kind of optimism of the future that a lot of was reflected in TOS, but you saw him realize that the universe isn't all open, welcome arms, hi, stranger, you're my new best friend. And... You know, I think it's, you know, it's a reality. It's, well, you know, I think it, that's it's a reality in the show. We don't know what's reality yet. My, right. my hope is, and call me foolish and naive, and I'm happy to be that way, that any species out there that has somehow succeeded in faster than light travel to the point where it can find other life is doing it out of a pure desire to learn and grow and discover and explore as opposed to conquer. Now right. I know historically humans have gone to other places and conquered. Right. I I'm I just call me naive and I'm happy and I want to die as this naive. Hey, I any, listen. Any highly intelligent alien that we meet that is more intelligent, excuse me, more advanced than we are has elevated to the point where they realize that fighting is ridiculous and hostility is ridiculous. Absurd. There's nothing that comes from it. Go, go. Oh, good. Disagree. Uh, I would disagree. There is pure evil in the world too, but go Madrid. Even uh, villains love their children. I, I don't know who that exact character is. And, and we could have a whole nother discussion on evil. Um, <laughs> uh, and not that I'm that knowledgeable about it. I, I, I'm, I'm conflicted by the definition of evil and whether true, pure, pure evil exists. Okay. Well, let's move off from evil to good uh, before we wrap things up. Yes. I want to give you a second to talk about the Roddenberry Foundation. <laughs> yes. Um, and all the amazing good works that, that you do. You founded it, correct? Well, yeah, yes. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, Founded it with uh, uh, Mort Kessler, uh, Andy Garb, and Heidi Roddenberry. We, we all founded it together uh, in 2010. And um, uh, basically, it, it's, it's almost what you guys would think. It's, it's, um, it's an organization that finds uh, entities, individuals, people out there that are working towards the long-term advancement of our species. Uh, no band-aid solution. So the kinds of things that they might be working on, at least in our in our uh, larger donations and contributions, um, are, are finding things that that systemic issues. It's um, it's always I gotta think of a new example to give, but it's sort of the, the cure to cancer. People are working on that. That's just too big of a topic. But anyhow, the cure to cancer, rather dealing with the effects of cancer on people. There are other organizations that kind of work on that and, and provide funding for that kind of research and that kind of work. We're trying to find the people who are looking at the, the cures for these things. And it's not just medical, but it, it could be anything in space or, 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 or uh, society or, or education. The root cause of an issue, is there a way to fix it, change it, make it better? And um, the foundations, the what you guys... Um were the ones that matched the Hollywood Food Coalition last year. Yes. With donations. Yes. yes. No, absolutely happy. Yeah. But, uh, John is incredible. Um, he's, I'm sitting here talking about our foundation. And while I am involved and we do meet and we do talk about it, we have a team of people that do the, the legwork and work for us. John Billingsley puts his money where his mouth is. Always. Uh, with the, the Ho Hollywood Food Coalition, he, he doesn't just get out there and, and promote it and, and get people involved. Uh, which he does incredibly well because he's incredibly passionate about it. But he's also there on the ground, on the floor, working there, um, um, making things happen. So I, I have the highest respect for him. 
And we will be seeing you, or at least part of the Roddenberry Foundation, at Trek Talks 2 then, which is January 14th. We, yeah. Uh, oh, I, if the, I, nah, uh-huh. we haven't talked about it yet, but I feel oh. like that I'd like to be a part of it. <laughs> That's a great, I'm going to take note of that because yeah. that has to happen soon. Yeah, January 14th is Trek Talks 2. Um, that was one of the things that I, you know, obviously when John came on the show, it's like, we're going to talk about Hollywood Food Coalition. I promise it's not all enterprise. Um, so I'm really excited. I offered to be involved. I don't know, you know, any way I can, even if it's just donating, um, cause it's a fantastic day to just sit and veg in front of your TV and spend eight hours just watching all things Star Trek. And they'll put you to work for sure. Yeah, no, I hope so. I would love that. Um, the other thing that I really had to ask you about off of your whip wiki page is the thing about the scuba diving and <laughs> yeah that, that like i said i haven't been to that page in a while the scuba diving yeah i i don't know what it says in there but i used to run sort of a diving group that became more of an adventure group that kind of fizzled out over time because i just didn't have time to run it but um i i've always been an avid scuba diver it is the closest thing to exploring strange new worlds because when you're underwater you're truly in another world on a different environment requiring you to have an apparatus to breathe and survive. And not only that, you've got all of these crazy aliens, fish, octopus, all, every, that, that live in this world that you're so, so foreign in and foreign to. And it is, truly, it is truly exploring strange new worlds. And if anyone is interested, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, I, I don't know what else to say about it, except it is... I I dated a scuba diver once and he talked me into trying it and I tried it out in a pool. They were having like mm-hmm. a discover scuba thing. Yep. And that was, that was as far. I just, it's I think it's, a, yeah, no, I, but um, I blame him because he didn't put my tank on right. And it kept hitting me in the back of my head. Yeah. So there's comfort is an incredibly important thing. And when you're not comfortable, it can ruin the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. But I just, the one thing I remember how cool it was, was they actually had a chess board like anchored to the bottom of the pool with weighted chess pieces. So if you wanted to stay and play chess on the bottom of the pool, that was, I thought that was kind of That's cool. a cool idea. That's a Isn't great idea. Isn't that a cool idea? idea? Yeah. That's a great so, idea. But yeah, so when I saw that you were a diver, it just kind of, it just kind of clicked with me because like I said, I've, I've tried it. Um, my friend, he, I mean, we stayed friends and he's, he's an avid diver and he used to go to Key West every year. So. Oh, I was just in Key West diving. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I, um, the have you ever, and the Dwayne. Yep. So have you done wreck dives? See, I can talk. Yeah. I can talk a good diving game. <laughs> There's a couple of wrecks down there and that's what we do. The, the Vandenberg, which was sunk, I think, I don't know, 10, 15, okay, could be 20 years ago now, time flies. And then the, the Dwayne, uh, which is, I think, a Canadian Coast Guard cutter, a U.S. Coast Guard cutter uh, on, in the Key Largo area. And I mean, they were both great dives. A little murky this time of year, but that's okay. Yeah, divers go... Uh, ha- Lasso. <laughs> all sorts of, uh, all divers. sorts of diving jokes. Yeah. That yes. one was, but, um, yeah, I just, i found it fascinating. Um, and you're, you know, just from the little bits that I, you know, little the movies and, and knowing him and everything he's, he, uh, did, uh, the great coral reef in, uh, Australia. Who, who's uh, that? Wait, my what? friend, my friend oh, did, did dove, dove the coral reef in Australia. Mm-hmm. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a quick story relating to Star Trek or my father, I might as well tell, because again, not something I really tell very often, was my, my first diving experience was with my father. Um, we, I was, oh God, I think, are we, oh yeah, 1988, I guess. So Next Generation had been out a year. I was in my new junior high. I had just made a friend. Maybe it was 87. might have been the first year. Anyhow. Um, yeah, it must have been the second year. Anyhow, went to uh, my father took our family to Tahiti, and I got to bring my 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 friend. Oh, did I bring my friend on that one? Yeah, I brought my friend on that one. And um, I was again thirteen, fourteen at the time, and I I there was a shop, you know, as they have them, and then you could do a Discover Scuba. Mm-hmm. Little did we know there was a a hurricane, or maybe it was a cyclone. I can't remember what it is on that side of the equator, but. Uh, there was a huge storm coming in and I remember the stars, the stars, the skies being gray and it was my father, me, and we did, we were in the pool for a moment. They did up, down, whatever. And then they took us right out to the ocean 
I just remember kicking so hard because there was so much current because I think the, the swell was coming in and just having sort of like a really rough time. Um, but, but I survived and everything was great. But that was my first diving experience with my father. Yeah, you did what I, what I always do on the show. It's so funny is I will get so off topic and then somehow I will be able to turn it all the way back around to Star Trek. So kudos to you because it's exactly <laughs> what you just did. Usually I get lost. We went off on a diving tangent and you still brought it back around to Gene Ronberry and I love that because that's so me. Um, well, guys, if you have any final questions, Rod, I, you know, hurry up and get them in because we're starting to close things yeah. down because you've been with us for an hour and a half. Somebody is desperate for dessert. Yes, yeah, someone's so, desperate for dessert and it's bedtime as well. So, probably. Oh, so you're going to give them a sugar rush and then make them go to bed. I know. That's, I never understood dessert for that reason. Like load your kids up on sugar right before you put them to bed. It's a fatal flaw. <laughs> Rod, thank you so much for joining us tonight and talking and filling us all in on some amazing stories. And your take on Star Trek and amazing stories about your dad and your mom. Some Absolutely. Um, love being here. We loved having you. Um, hopefully, if I don't talk to you between now and then, hopefully we'll have a chance to hang out in Vegas, which hopefully will be here sooner rather than later because it's one of the highlights of my year. So. Yes, looking forward to it. Looking a forward to it. Absolutely. All right, guys. Catch me here next week for, I don't know, we'll think of something and I will always fill you in on the topic as soon as I think of what it's going to be. Uh, Rod, thank you again for joining us. Thank you guys for hanging out. Chat Pack 2.0. You are very welcome, Faith. Always love having you here. And don't forget, everybody, until I see you again, live long and prosper. Yes, live long and prosper.